Everybody wants a story, and I told you the that I'm if a guy you know that's been you know John away for almost two years now 
he's made what a three minute documentary Ooh. too much if people are doing this too much because they think they're stressed they're not going to get anything done i'm you know it's just it's just the way with anything if you over medicate yourself you're screwing yourself over big time i don't care what it is self-medicating with pot with booze pills it all ends the same bad so stop <laughs> take it from an expert believe me gone through the drinking thing you know it was hard to get out of but i did gotten through the drug thing you know when i was in the scene it was mainly drinking for me and then if I drank too much, you know, but I'm just saying the guy that I was waiting to do, waiting on to do this, you know, biopic documentary, whatever the hell you want to call it. He's just, he just has no motivation. And the other guy has a lot. Carlos Knight, that's his name. So he's going to do it, but it's going to be in Spanish because no one really cares about metal in America anymore. If I'm wrong, prove it to me. I am not wrong. And I'm not talking bleh, metal. Yeah, the heaviest metal is that Americans will take is basically Metallica, which is not anything outside the box now. They're completely acceptable, and the parents are listening to Metallica while the kids are wondering... Well, what do I listen to? Well, we don't listen to the parents' music. That's never, you know. When you're growing up, you listen to what your parents listen to because you have no choice. You're a little kid. Then you pick your own music and you go off. But see, no one has that to do anymore. That's why I'm going back, and we're going to start over again so kids can relearn what they need to know, and they can start the new bands, the new Van Halens, the new... And there's kids out there. I see the young little Randy Rhodes kids. There's one guy in England. He's amazing. Just got to get his stuff together and do it. Or he can just sit there in his bedroom and play uh, and get videos and do that all day. If you want. There's nothing that beats playing on live on stage. So get your ass together and do it. I'm going to try to do it. I gotta hire another drummer, but this guy seems cool. I'm gonna do it in a week or two. Sit down and I gotta shell out the money, but he's got a whole studio. So I just go to his house with my guitar and we jam for a couple hours and I give him the cash and, and that's it. That I can deal with. That way I get all the songs in my head or on recording to where I, okay, this is how it's gonna go and then I record it. And here's the thing, I just came up with this, I was messing around doing like a Mean Street, not even really Mean Street, but I guess, Mean Street, and uh, I ended up playing this little riff that I was doing, I came up with years ago, but it kind of sounds like it could be something, I don't know, so I'm going to play some stuff, I'll start off with that little riff, and then you tell me what you think, or as usual, don't say anything. Because I usually get no comments. So start commenting. Or this is stopping. Or I'll do it, but I just won't talk. Oh, I'll give you a story later. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
other stuff. The main thing is that, 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 that I came up with that like 30 years ago. But I was trying to play Mean Street, something kind of like that, and that came out. Is it something? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Oh, please, comments. Please! You guys are tripping me out. I'm like, what am I doing around here? Okay, story, story, story. Uh, oh, well, someone asked me, you know, tell a story about Warrant or Janie Lane. One, we uh, played with Warrant a couple of times, pre Janie Lane and whoever it is he brought into the band. And actually, I like those guys a lot better, the original singer for Warrant. Janie Lane it was not. The other guy was way better, I thought. But the band kicked him out and brought in the singer, uh, Janie, and the drummer? I can't remember. I, I don't keep up with other bands. I don't. That wasn't my thing. People can tell me, oh, this guy was in this band, this dude, and this, this. I don't know anything about any bands but mine. Because why? 
<laughs> Who cares? Very few bands I, I even talk to. I could care less. I was focused on me and doing what I needed to do. I could care less about anybody else. I know it sounds self-centered, but you got to stay focused. In order, if this is going to be your life, then you stay focused. So the Jenny Lane story is basically this. My first wife, you know, met her when she was 16, got her pregnant, you know, we got married. So, and I was 18. So, there you go. So, it was shotgun wedding. But, uh, which is not a, it's a good name for a band, but, you know. So, I got married to her, and, uh, uh, the biggest mistake I made was taking her to Hollywood because every freaking guy in the world was just going nuts for her. And I couldn't, I'm like, she's, yeah, she's cute and everything, but, you know, lay off. I had to chase Ricky Rocket around the parking lot of this place down because he was writing letters to her. And her friend, my first wife's friend, this fat, lit chick, she wanted us to separate so she would get her friend back, but it didn't happen anyways. So she was trying really hard, so she was like telling these idiots in this new goofy gay band Poison, which I never thought would be big, but as soon as, because I saw their first performance, I was dragged down there by uh, my first wife's friend, and we went down and the guitar player did a header off the stage of the country club, and he went home. That was it. I'm like, good. They suck. We don't need them. They're just a Motley Crue ripoff. And then CeCe got in, and that changed the whole dynamic of the band completely. If CeCe never joined Poison, they would have never made it. People may say he's a nut, he sucks, but he makes that band. Not Brett. Brett helps. He's not the, the front man of the world, though. He's just a, you know, wannabe Vince Neil. Come on, let's face it. The first Poison album, really? It's a wannabe Vince Neil. He could barely sing. And uh, so there you go. So anyways, Ginny Lane was, had it, you know, besides Ricky Rock, I just had to chase him. Ginny, I was at her house, we'd separated, so, you know, I was you know, goofing off, but she couldn't goof off, you know how it is, double standard, so he drives by, and he's, he shouts out that he loves her, that's it, he's on the death list, so, <laughs> a couple weeks go by, and me and my bass player, Tony Rydell, were at this party, he was there to, you know, pick up on somebody, and uh, they weren't there, so we're leaving, and the party's in the back of the house, you know, and they're all in the backyard, and we're like, screw it, we're going to another party. Walking out the front door, and up pulls Janie in his new Corvette, which is making me even more mad now, because, like, how could they even get signed? I mean, Guns and Roses, and then now Warrant? Really? This is the end of the world. So, you know, he's walking up, and I'm like, tell, I say, Tony, Stay here. Let's stay inside. When he opens the door, we'll surprise him. He goes, okay, what do you want to do? I'll go, just say, boo! Because I wanted to catch him off guard. So, Janie opens the door. Tony goes, boo! I'm like, hey! And he goes, I know you from somewhere. And I'm like, do you? Wham! Just clocked him. <laughs> and he falls forward into my bass player, and he pushes him against the wall, and then he just kind of goes, Burr. and I'm like, cool, dude, let's go, man. He's like, why did you hit him? And I told him, he goes, oh, screw that guy. So we left. That was it. We left him laying out cold in the you know front door of this house. So there's my Janie Lane story. going down the toilet after, you know. But anyways, I felt sorry for, you know, doing that after you know, seeing his life and how he kind of spiraled in there. That, that's sad. But, you know, that's the, that's the way it is. So, yeah, I, I hit, I, and all of these were like almost sucker punches, like, yeah, and I'm like, what, what, wham! 
Because that's the only way I can win. What am I going to do? Dance around on my heels? Break a nail? Uh-uh. So, <laughs> I mean, this guy is not who was in the 80s. It was like I weighed 150 pounds and, you know, I looked like a chick. So I had, you know, fight dirty. And I was a good fighter and it's all through school. I won every fight I was ever, except for one, Zareeb Harb. He was a karate expert. He took me down. So I went and learned karate. And thankfully, they had a big window so everybody that was walking by in the mall could see everybody doing karate. And everybody at my school saw that I was doing karate. And, you know, color of the belt didn't mean anything. All they knew is I knew karate. So that took care of most of my school. There was a few idiots, but I never fought anybody, really. The last fight was in, like, ninth grade, as far as school. And then outside, there was a few. Thank you.